Since their inception, the Brutes of the Halo series had a tough time fitting in with the rest of the series' enemy roster. Bungie had a solid foundation with the three core enemies, the cowardly grunts, the defensive jackal, and the fearsome elites. Like a fourth musketeer, they often had trouble fitting in with the rest. With 343's latest installment in the series, Halo Infinite, Brutes have finally found a place they can call home. So let's take a look back at their troubled past and see how 343 finished what Bungie started. Both in lore and in gameplay, Brutes always lived in the Elite Shadow, often perceived by fans as replacement elites. Brutes had big shoes to fill. While this may have been their role in the story, this was never their role in gameplay. Lacking regenerating shields, they were often deployed in groups or packs, in numbers far greater than elites ever were. Their only real protection were helmets on their heads that stopped them from being insta-killed by headshots. Their main purpose was to create a different combat flavor the mix-up often seen in Halo games' second half. As opposed to the player mirror that elites were, they were meant to be more of a generic soldier type, similar to the type of amorphous enemy forces you could see in games like Fear or Half-Life. As the series continued, things got muddled. The elites switched sides, and Brutes had to fill many of the roles that they had left vacant. Brutes were no longer just generic infantry, they were also officers, mini-bosses, and even stealth units. However, they never really left their pack history behind, which would often be at odds with the new roles they had to fill. Things weren't all bad, however. With more breathing room, Brutes were able to develop their own roles and subclasses, ones that fit their characters a little better. For example, you had chaotic squads of jump pack Brutes, or the fearsome heavy weapons chieftains. These variety of unit types also started to portray Brutes as more pragmatic than in the past. They were often seen wielding a variety of weapons and using a whole arsenal of equipment. Sadly, things continued to get muddled. When elites retook their place as main antagonists, they took up some of the roles and responsibilities the Brutes had invented. It was not unusual to see a spry and agile elite wielding a clunky heavy weapon. And for a time, it seemed things would stay that way. Brutes faded away and it seemed they would be stuck in limbo forever, always in someone else's shadow. Until 11 years later, when a new game arrived. The Brutes, once again, took center stage, this time alongside their elite brothers. Everything from the past games was thrown in and refined. They no longer had just helmets, but multi-layered armored suits. This allowed them to retake their infantry role. They could now be deployed in large-scale battles that rival the previous games. Their pragmatism even returned with their new unit variety and AI capabilities. From chieftains to snipers to berserkers, they have the most unit variety out of any species in the game. Yet, they never overstepped. Elites continued to maintain their own identity and character. This can be especially felt in the boss and mini-boss battles. Elite combat will have more of a dance, a duel that ebbs and flows. Their shields will recharge, or active camouflage will make them disappear. Brute combat, on the other hand, is a whole different story. They don't move, you do. They will often pressure you and force you to move around them. Even though they don't rely on it, they will often be seen equipped with shields. Couple that with the refined weapon sandbox, they practically encourage the weapon swapping that makes the series so iconic. Three Four Three did such an amazing job refining Brutes that I can't imagine the Halo series without them. 
From broken bullet sponges to pragmatic tacticians, it truly has been a brutal road for these tough apes.